Josefina Lindblom from DG Environment to introduce you to Levels. And Josefina has been leading the development of the framework on behalf of the Commission. Josefina, over to you. Thank you very much, Judith, and thanks everyone for organizing this webinar. Uh, I am Josefina Lindblom and I work at DG Environment. And uh, as uh, Judith just said, we have been working together very closely with DG Grow colleagues in DigiGrow as well on this one. Levels that I'm going to talk about today is a tool to assess and report sustainability performance in the building sector. <coughs> so uh, my first intervention here, we go through those points, what Levels is, what it covers, how was it developed, and, and the benefits that we see with Levels as well. Um, not just us, I should say, but, but uh, most of all, or most, more importantly, the stakeholders that have been involved in developing this. So, what is Levels? Well, Levels is a tool to report on sustainability for buildings. It takes, uh, or it supports a holistic assessment of buildings, meaning that it covers the full life cycle from extraction of materials uh, until the end of life. And it looks at several aspects of building uh, beyond energy efficiency, which we are perhaps used to, to looking at more carefully. We are using a limited number of indicators. That is what makes it quite special uh, compared to other tools existing on the market, trying to, to take this broader holistic approach. And of course, uh, levels is, is voluntary. Levels uh, has been developed with offices and housing uh, in mind, and it is catering for new built and renovation, major renovation projects. It is not sought uh, directly for, for existing buildings as such. We are targeting the mainstream market, and I think that's what makes it special compared to many other uh, certification and schemes, etc. And that is, of course, why we are using a limited number of indicators, as I just said. And uh, I should stress that they are, as much as possible, based on existing standards as well. But it is also important to understand from the outset what Levels is not, I think. Levels is not an EU certification scheme, so there is no such thing as Levels Plus or Levels A or Levels Gold or something like that. We don't set EU benchmarks. It is a tool to assess and report on sustainability performance, but we are not using benchmarks and we are not certifying it from our side. We do hope, of course, that other organizations or perhaps even member states will choose to set their own benchmarks on some of those indicators that I will talk about later on, but these benchmarks will not come from the EU. Also, I want to stress that although we are not uh, providing a certification scheme as such, we have worked very closely with a number of, uh, of stakeholders, building professionals during this process, um, of which we also had several of the big uh, certificate schemes in Europe. And they have been very much involved in, in this work because they want to be able to use those, those indicators that we are suggesting. Uh, in their schemes next to their larger set of, of, of indicators, which, which are specific then for each individual certification scheme. But so this means that even though levels will not certify as such, it will have an indirect impact on certification in Europe because we can see already now actually how the levels indicators are starting to be picked up by those important certification schemes. So what are the different areas that Levels is covering, actually? On the, the three top here on this slide, you can see three different kinds of, of resources, use of resources, which Levels is covering and which are, of course, immediately or directly linked to environmental impact. So that's uh, the full life cycle of, of energy. We have water use and we have materials. Uh, and, and linked to that, of course, the issue with waste. Those are the first three ones. 
um, to say that when we started this work, uh, we actually thought that that would be enough. We wanted to focus on the research use. But we were very quickly convinced by building professionals and member states that in order to make this a really attractive tool for, for the mainstream market, we should also include other aspects which are more linked to the quality and the value of the building. And those are the three ones you see at the bottom. So that um, has some comfort. It's resilience to climate change and life cycle costing. So those are the six different areas we have. Uh, and to those six different areas, we have indicators linked to them. <coughs> indicators. Now, we have limited time here today, so I will not go through them. But I wanted to show you where they are, where you can find them easily, because I, I assume that you can have access to this, this, uh, these slides afterwards. So just to say that on the left-hand side of this uh, slide, you see these six areas, or the six macro objectives, as we actually call them, that I just mentioned to you. So it's basically energy, material, water, um, health and comfort, climate change, and cost and value. And then in the boxes next to them, you can see the indicators which link to them. But I will not go through them in detail now, but this is where you find them. Also, uh, what, uh, what happened during the development phase of Levels was that we realized that we needed to actually provide not just one way of working with indicators, but three different ways, and we call them three different levels. So the first level is really targeting, I would say, the mainstream market, which, uh, which is not used to assess um, the building performance or the sustainability performance of a building beyond energy efficiency, but wants to get started. They, these kinds of, of building projects or the organizations dealing with those building projects, they may not have um, access to all very specific data that would be required to make a very precise assessment. But they still have some interesting stuff which can be used and they can see how different, by using levels on the first, you can still see how different decisions that you take have an impact on the performance of the building and how you can work to actually uh, actually uh, improve them. And then you have two other levels which you can use if you want to uh, be more specific with your assessment and even use it to optimize your design later on. Levels was developed between 2015 and 2017 and it was a huge collaboration between different groups of building professionals. It was a very interactive process and we had several rounds of consultations. And that was, I think, the, the reason why I think it's a very good, 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 good product. We started off with the MAC objectives in the first year, and then in the second year, we decided or we identified the indicators that would be linked to those MAC objectives, as I just showed you. And then actually at the very last stage during the public consultation, it became clear that we needed to provide different levels of working with the indicators. So I would say that everything that I've showed you so far is actually a clear outcome of the, of the great um, interactive process that we've had with stakeholders. The benefits that we see with levels and what we certainly hear from, hear from billing professionals looking at it is that it provides a common language. It is a simple entry point to something which can be quite complex because buildings are complex products. Uh, with, with levels, uh, it should be possible to influence decision making along the life cycle, support the business case, which always needs data, obviously, and this is what levels can generate, but also to guide policy. Um, we are in touch with a lot of member states, uh, policy makers, which are interested in using levels for, for their different building policies. And we clearly see how this can complement initiatives. This is not sort of another certification scheme, as I said. It is a common language, and this is how it can complement existing stuff. This is part of our web page, and I just wanted to show you that uh, on that web page, uh, you find the technical documentation, introduction to levels, but also how it works and how you can use the indicators more precisely, and you find it in six different languages. So to conclude, what I would like you to take uh, away from this uh, introduction is that it is a common language. It covers the full life cycle. We are really targeting the mainstream market with this one. It's not that we expect the mainstream market to suddenly you know, perform 
fantastic buildings, but it is a way of, of getting aware of how you can improve and get better, even if you don't suddenly produce the best buildings, uh, but how you can make steps forward. And I wanted to remind you again that it has really been um, developed by and for building professionals. Thank you. Many thanks, Josefina. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, while we're waiting for the audience to put some questions, um, I've got a couple of ones for you. Um, we wondered how you see other in EU institutions um, reference or integrate some of this work um, in their reporting formats. Um, yeah, so for example, uh, we have a lot of contracts with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which are keen on, they, of course, they are funding lots of, of building projects in different parts of Europe and outside of Europe as well. Uh, and they are keen on, they have for, for a long time uh, tried to, to sort of set their own sustainability standards and, and work with this concept when they are funding projects, but this has always been a bit ad hoc to them because they haven't found a suitable tool to work with. Um, <clears throat> some of those big certification schemes out there uh, which, which do uh, excellent work for the best performers, so to say, in the market may not be the most suitable ones for, for other projects where you still would like to, to have a good feeling for how you could do a bit better than just any standard building project. So they are now looking at how to use levels, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, interest from the, uh, the department here in Brussels, which are responsible for the commission buildings, to look at how they could test levels and see how it would work, um, because they are, of course, managing lots of buildings here. So they are looking into this as well with great interest, followed our process during the development stage as well. And it's worth noting that uh, Levels is, is just reaching its piloting stage, um, which I mentioned before. There's an excellent question from someone from, from Alexander Delianis, if I pronounce him correctly, from the audience. He says, hello and thank you for this presentation. If Levels does not set benchmarks, will there be a sort of database that can highlight, help highlight best practices? Yes, that is an excellent question. And it is a question that I get quite often. And I understand there is a great interest in that. Now, the Commission will not, does not foresee to set up a database as such. It is not something that the Commission normally does, uh, and it would take a lot of resource not just to set up, but to maintain, because that would have to be maintained, of course. But uh, when I'm traveling around to different member states to discuss this tool with ministries, um, they are, uh, very many of them see an interest from their side to put up um, such a national database, and perhaps it could also be sector um, uh, actors uh, who would see an interest in putting it up on, on a European level, but otherwise I think it is something that is more likely to happen on the national level, actually. Okay. Um, and there's one more question, but we're actually running short, time, so we might have to save it for the questions at the very end um, about the number of projects that, that are using levels now, and it's, it's a really good question for when we discuss the test phase. We're going to get two other experts, and uh, the first one is going to be um, Esfand, Esfandia Berman, Dr. Esfand Berman, who's a lecturer at the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources. Esfand has studied more buildings in more detail than any building performance professional I know and I know a few. Today he's going to tell us about the benefits of a holistic approach to building performance data, which means what data to collect and for what purpose and what does it tell us. Esfan, please fire away. Um, thank you, Nidhi. Before I start, just to check, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. Many thanks to Josefina and Judith uh, for the great presentations. Um, this presentation is really an overview uh, of the interim results of an ongoing research project, and uh, this research project entails a number of case studies, including case studies in housing sector and offices, and we have already registered a couple of uh, case studies for the levels testing phase. 
So just go through the results, and the idea is basically to show what data can basically tell us, the insights that data can provide us when we go beyond the standard level of, if you like, monitoring, the conventional level of monitoring, and try to look into disaggregated energy data, but also indoor environmental quality. So uh, the idea is basically to provide a holistic approach to energy and indoor environmental quality with special focus on indoor air quality, which is uh, quite topical at the moment in the UK and many European countries as well as a result of uh, outdoor pollution. But I'll also show you one example in, uh, to signify the importance of internal sources of pollution as well. A couple of case studies, um, uh, available data that we collected from this uh, project and relevance to levels. Uh, you did already uh, refer to the problem of unintended consequences of energy efficiency policies, and this has been uh, the focus of a number of our research projects. Overheating problems, for example, in airtight uh, new buildings, uh, problems to do with indoor air quality, and so on and so forth. So the idea here is uh, relatively quick wins as a result of implementing energy efficiency measures might as well bring some unintended consequences of some losses in indoor environmental quality. So the idea is to, to view energy as the input to the environmental systems of a building and indoor environmental quality as the output. So we really need to take into account the total performance of buildings. This is uh, one of our case studies it's registered for level testing phase. Um, and what we did here in this uh, example, uh, this, this case was quite important for us because the building has been subject to performance contracting. Again, performance contracting was touched on by Judith in her presentation. And the idea was uh, basically to try and uh, guarantee a certain level of performance, energy performance within this contract. Uh, to tackle the problem of the energy performance gap, which is quite endemic in the industry, the discrepancy between actual operational buildings and design intents. So from process point of view, this is a very important case for us, and we would like to see the results. The asset rating or energy performance certificate of this building was A-rated, and the idea was to have display energy certificate, which is basically the operational rating of the building based on the actual data, A-rated as well by the second year of operation, now, what happened, as you can see, they didn't quite achieve that. Uh, they got a B-rated uh, operational rating, which is quite good compared to the rest of the building stock, but there are still some lessons to be learned. And as a matter of fact, the main contractor in charge of this project has quite recently de delivered another project uh, in the UK, and in that project, again, this, they had this operational um, rating of A to as target, and they managed to achieve. So it's a learning curve. It's a very good project in the sense that there are very useful lessons to be learned and to scale up for wider application in the industry. So what we did here in this project, we had access to total energy use per fuel, but also disaggregated energy use, high granularity. We had half hourly data, you can see on right hand side of this slide in terms of electrical demand, but also monthly, yearly data. And uh, as you can see on the left-hand side top graph, for example, you have energy budgets. So the tight budget set out at design stage with the building, and then the actual operation of the building year one and year two. And based on that, this data, the designer and contractors highlighted the uh, energy end users that basically should be the prime target for energy savings, namely heating, lighting, and auxiliary because you can see significant discrepancy in terms of these end users compared to the energy budget. And as you can see, in the second year of operation, they managed to reduce these end users significantly, although there's still an element of gap and they're still working on the project in the third and fourth year as well. Also, net electrical demand of the building is quite telling because usually we would expect to see a so-called bell-shaped curve but as a result of a very large PV installation in this building, you don't see that uh, daytime peak electrical demand, which tells us that the PV installation has been quite effective and they really need to tackle the baseline demand of the building to further reduce energy consumption. So this will inform further uh, energy saving scenarios and optimization activities. So in terms of energy performance, they are doing very good, if not 100% you know, uh, in line with the design target. 
But what we uncovered in this building was uh, issues around indoor environmental quality, which were not quite guarded within that performance contract, unfortunately. So, for example, the CO2 concentration level on one large open plan um, zone of this office building were frequently above 1500 ppm, which is not deemed to be acceptable as a result of some malfunctioning sensors. So they had natural ventilation, automated vents, but the automated vents were not functional because the CO2 sensors had some technical issues. Also, on the right-hand side, you can see that PM2.5 micro, the concentration level of microparticles were fr frequently higher than uh, WHO limits, the World Health Organization limits in other zones. So we came across some interesting issues around air quality in this building. Given the building is subject to performance contracting, this was quite uh, insightful. Also out of range values, and I was quite happy to see within the levels framework going through the spreadsheet you know, and the uh, KPIs developed that out of range values are quite important in terms of levels. And that's exactly what we try to do here. This is the outcome of thermal comfort study we did. And for example, you can see in terms of temperatures, um, on the second and third floor of the building, the temperatures are relatively, I mean, they're lower than the acceptable range for office buildings, which definitely helps them in terms of the heating energy budgets, but it's not good from thermal comfort. So you can see the conflict between energy and thermal comfort, and then we can quantify these out of range values in terms of total percentage of uh, temperature or relative humidity outside uh, thermal comfort range. Um, in terms of air quality, we followed uh, the detailed analysis carried out as part of 68 of um, International Energy Agency um, Energy in Buildings and Communities program, which has highlighted um, major indoor and outdoor sources of pollution and contaminants of interest which could have high concentration levels in low energy buildings. You can see these, a number of them are um, sourced by outdoor um, sources of pollution like microparticles, nitrogen dioxide, also benzene. Some of them are predominantly internally driven. You have a number of VOCs here. So we captured all these species within this project and other cases studies. This is our office building, subject to performance contracting, natural ventilated strategy on right-hand side, indoor, left-hand side, outdoor, you can see the louvers, uh, manually operable windows, and at higher level, automated vents. So what we managed to capture by means of data collection here was a, quite an interesting interplay between concentration level of CO2s, which are conventionally, CO2 levels are, con are conventionally used in the industry as a proxy for indoor air quality. However, you can see a nice interplay between CO2 and other contaminants. Here, you can see the NO2 results. The same applies to PM2.5. The same zone, which had problems in terms of automated vents, with high levels of CO2 levels close to 2,500 here. The peak is around 2,500. You can see it has uh, the least NO2 levels and also PM2.5. And this brings the opportunity to optimize control strategies based on outdoor pollution as, and not necessarily and only based on indoor concentration level, level of a species like CO2, for example. So this brings the idea of um, optimization of natural or indeed any ventilation strategy based on health indicators and various proxies of indoor quality as opposed to a single proxy like CO2. Um, another case study, this one is not an office building, but still it's quite important to signify the issue. It's a um, hospital building that we monitor, full mechanical ventilation. You can see the stark contrast. In terms of CO2 levels, CO2 levels are quite low. The maximum level is 800 ppm. Compared to the previous case, it's fantastic. However, the question is, is CO2, is, is, is it the only proxy? According to the industry, mainstream, you know, projects in the industry, they won't only uh, monitor CO2. But let's proceed. If you monitor also microparticles, PM2.5, again, fantastic air quality if you take PM2.5 as proxy. You can see the indoor uh, PM2.5 are significantly lower than outdoor, almost negligible, and below the standard limits. Great, because you have high-grade filtration within the air handling unit. It's mechanical ventilation strategy. However, 
If you take into account another important proxy, another source of pollution coming predominantly from outside, notably from diesel engines, now we have this problem at this level, as we, uh, I'm sure you're aware. In terms of NO2, you can see there's no control measure for NO2. So indoor NO2 levels closely follow our outdoor levels. And that's the main issue in this building. So despite the fact that it's a hospital building, full mechanical ventilation, great filtration, but particle filtration cannot control NO2. You really need a chemical process. So for example, in this case, case we really need activated carbon filters to make sure we can reduce NO2 level. As things stand, there's no control over the NO2, and NO2 levels are very frequently higher than WHO limits of 20 one particle per billion. So this gives you an idea of how if you go beyond one or two contaminants and try to capture the whole spectrum of critical contaminants, you can identify problem issues and formulate um, improvement opportunities or optimization opportunities. Just uh, one final point in terms of internal sources of pollution, which could be quite relevant to architects in terms of material selection. We monitor formaldehyde uh, concentration limits in all cases studies, and notably in our residential buildings, very often formaldehyde levels of, are significantly higher than the, than the WHO limits, almost three times, as you can see in a couple of examples, a couple of flats here. So benzene and formaldehyde levels higher than WHO limits or Annex 68 of uh, International Energy Agency, which is underpinned by WHO limit. So in terms of um, source control, material selection, and the VOC levels and VOC emission factors of the material, the industry is not quite there. And the evidence emerging from the, this project is actually reinforced by other studies coming from Annex 68 of International Energy Agency program as well. So the entire statistical sample that we hold for Europe and North America for multi-high concentration levels are actually higher than the standard limit. So this is a major issue that should be taken into account at design stage for every project in terms of engaging suppliers and material selection, but also more broadly in terms of specifying stringent limits for the suppliers and manufacturers. So very briefly, to conclude, energy performance contracting has proved very effective to close the energy performance gap. However, the suggestion is also to take into account environmental performance gap and move towards energy plus environmental performance contracting. Uh, in terms of outdoor uh, sources of pollution, there are opportunities to improve the existing ventilation strategies in the industry to optimize health and well-being in addition to energy. And in terms of VOC source control, and more importantly, the most uh, important VOC in terms of health impact is formaldehyde. We really need to uh, strengthen the existing standards, but also existing uh, delivery methods and make sure the industry is quite there in terms of reducing the emission factors for various VOCs, including formaldehyde. Relevance to level, I've already touched on it. We are going to basically upload our data that we gathered for two case studies from a research program during the testing phase of levels and hopefully would be able to give feedback, more structured feedback in terms of consistency between data capture and level structure later on in another opportunity, maybe another webinar. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm ready to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Eslan. That was wonderfully insightful. Um, <clears throat> I just wondered very quickly, while we wait for any questions from the audience, um, so much detailed data might look a bit scary to architects who tend to be more generalists. Um, to what extent do we do we think, especially in the context of the development of the smart readiness indicator, to what extent do you think it might be possible for uh, smart equipment and services to report on this kind of data in a more user-friendly way uh, so that lay people might um, get their teeth into this as well? Well, but that's a very good question, and to be honest with you, we still have a significant gap in the industry in terms of sensor sensing, monitoring, and control of these devices. Having said that, there are very good equipment now in the field that could at least give us a holistic view of total VOC, if not individual VOC, so TVOC, which is very useful to give us an indication of um, the trends, performance trends. CO2, of course, is established in the industry. 
in terms of microparticles, again, there are very good sensors that could be integrated into the existing control strategy of new building because, again, levels focus on sending primarily new buildings. So we, we could incorporate relatively cost-effective microparticle sensors into the BMS system. So at least in terms of the most, I think, best thing to do to address your question is to highlight the most important contaminants in terms of health impact. And if that's the case, you really need to go for microparticles, specifically PM2.5, nitrogen dioxide in terms of outdoor pollution, and even total VOC in terms of internal pollution would be enough because it gives you a good, very good indication of performance trends. So in terms of these basic and at the same time key contaminants, there are sensors that could be inc incorporated in the BMS system and give us feedback alongside energy consumption. I think this is feasible and managed. Fantastic, yes, and many thanks. I know there is a, a lot of discussion about when these sensors are going to be on in, inside each of our mobile phones. Um, certainly, it makes me worried about our indoor environment here. Um, and um, and and I think someone raised that the um, um, the, the the that perhaps there is a need to better link to cognitive scientists to communicate. Uh, the effect on, on building occupants, and some of that research is ongoing already. But without further ado, um, I'm going to, I'm very pleased to introduce Peter Andreas Satrup, who is a senior advisor at the Danish Association of Architectural Firms. And Peter Andreas will illustrate in more detail the potential that Levels presents to architects. Peter Andreas? Thank you very much, Judith. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Fantastic. And uh, now I just need control of the uh, slides. Yeah, perhaps you could speak up a little bit or turn your volume up a tiny bit. Okay, I'll do that. I need control of the slides, please. I am. Um, I don't have control of the slides. If you could, please. There you go. Uh, well, there you go. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a talk here. And I'm very delighted to uh, tell us tell a little bit about how we see the potentials of uh, levels. Um, just to introduce ourselves, uh, I'm heading sustainability at the uh, uh, Association of Danish Architectural Firms. Uh, which represents the commercial interests of uh, architects across um, uh, Denmark. We cover approximately 90% of the market, but um, let's go to levels. Um, we really think that there's a very high urgency in um, making sustainability services more, uh, more mainstream. We are uh, definitely able to deliver. We have a lot of architectural companies that Basically, can uh, can can do consultancies with uh, with with all of these aspects of uh, sustainable architecture, but we do miss um, uh, incentives in the market so that our clients actually ask for 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 these services. Uh, and this is where uh, levels and voluntary benchmarking reporting. We didn't get uh, with the revised EBPD, uh, I think that we have opportunities to create with our, uh, for ourselves with uh, adopting um, levels as an European approach. Um, uh, I have a problem. I need to shift the, uh, the slides. I don't have control. Could you please pass me the board? I need to have control of the slides, please. There you go. Thank you. All right. So let's talk about uh, sustainability in architectural design uh, and some uh, approaches to that. Um, I have a terrible lag in the presentation. There you go. Okay. It's like, uh, yeah. Okay. Sustainability. Uh, in Denmark, we have uh, adopted the DGNB standards stand uh, as, as a system for high-level sustainability certification. And here you have a comparison between what what uh, what do you achieve with the basic building regulations to the left and the DGNB system to to the right. And as you see, there's a difference. 
uh, which is uh, on two dimensions. You have uh, the number of, of uh, value dimensions that you actually cover in uh, in the system, um, and also how how what are what are the benchmarks? Obviously, with the high level TDM system, the benchmarks are quite a bit higher than uh, than um, than the building regulations, and they cover quite a few more uh, value dimensions. So. Um, the, the problem with that, that uh, approach is that the high-level uh, certification um, systems, they cover sort of a tiny fraction of, of the market. And basically, uh, most clients, they are content with just living up to the building regulations. So the really, que the really important question is how do we actually get the mainstream to achieve more? Um, and uh, that's where we hope that uh, levels come in. Um, here you go. So, uh, and that means that what we need to achieve really is uh, an intermediate system which has sort uh, sort of a, a lower uh, complexity than the high-level certification systems has, but uh, and which is achievable with less time and uh, and of course less cost to the client. Uh, but where we do achieve a, a high degree of value. So this intermediate system, what you see is sort of in between the building, building regulations and the uh, sustainability certification system. This is, this is really where we need, where we see a level come in. And we also think that this is really important because uh, levels uh, can generate a common language and we can, and we think that we can, uh, and we can integrate this with, uh, with the uh, building regulation sort of as in a voluntary um, sustainability class, this could be a really efficient way to motivate clients and uh, consultants to achieve uh, more sustainability in, uh, in the building environment. So um, just uh, to, 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 to uh, discuss you know, what is really the opportunity, I think that we need to discuss values in a more general terms, and how sustainability and architectural design, you know, what 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 is it really? Uh, we have an effort at the moment uh, among Danish architects in documenting the values that we actually produce uh, for society, for clients, of course, because thus uh, we're always, uh, you know, encountering skepticism. So, what is really what kind of values do our, does architecture really uh, produce? Is it, you know, uh, uh, um, Social cohesion, you know, in in in, um, in the built environment. Is it about generating uh, uh, general uh, spaces, lots of daylight, access, and so on? And of course, this is a, a very famous uh, instance by by the Argentines architects, which is very popular with uh, with with architects. You could also point to energy efficiency. This is one of the first uh, near zero energy buildings by Henning Larsen Architects. And um, and where we use the voluntary energy classes uh, at first um, from the first uh, um, first uh, issue of the uh, of the EBPD, uh, we can also take it uh, a step further. This is uh, Home for Life by Art Architects, work, which is actually a zero uh, carbon building over its life cycle of thirty four years, forty years, and so we also account for the materials that are actually have gone into the construction. And you can look only at the materials of construction as architects have done here, and they actually have produced, uh, or produced uh, they've saved 86% uh, of, of their climate emissions uh, only by looking at the circular economy and how to recycle the materials in, in the buildings. So as you see, uh, there's a lot of different uh, philosophies, and some architects would actually argue that um, if only you produce something which is so, you know, spectacular, popular, and durable that uh, people love it and it gets listed from the beginning, you know, that is also an aspect of uh, of, uh, of of sustainable architecture. And I would actually agree uh, to some degree. But um, the real issue here is that when we when we talk about value, it's all, it's both about what what are sort of the the, the meanings and the, uh, the political values, aesthetic. Uh, I think values that uh, that that architects represent, but it's also a question of measuring performance. And I think that this is where we really have uh, to achieve something. We also work on the assumption that the the, the, the values that buildings 
actually generate. They really grow in time, and we're only uh, beginning to uh, to to map out what are the actual values that um, that uh, that are generated in in the life cycle of building. And I think that the here uh, in this discussion, levels could be very useful too because it has this life cycle approach. Um, so we really need to not only look at looking at the cost and the way we manage resources, but also at the benefits that we generate. This is really a crucial uh, point to us and looking at value in different dimensions, not only economic values. Um, yeah. So the really important things is to go through the entire life cycle from actually when you program the building, when you design it and you build it, and to go back to the crime scene and actually measure up, you know, what actually what actually happens here, both in environmental terms, but also in social and economic terms. What is what is happening? We need to we need this framework, and I think that levels is really the important first step here. Um, yeah. So we're beginning to to figure out, you know, what are the different tools that we need to document both costs and benefits uh, at different stages of the life cycle. And as you see, I think that there's a very high uh, degree of uh, overlap between what uh, levels propose and sort of the really basic idea of what are the essentials in sustainability reporting here, as you've seen. So this is sort of levels translated into our way of thinking. So what I think uh, is really important in this uh, in this testing phase is that we begin to um, <clears throat> find or discuss, you know, what is this uh, intermediate level uh, that balances complexity and value in, in the best possible way. And I think that the, that the design of levels that you can work with different levels of detailing uh, is uh, really intelligent. I think that there's a need to develop some digital support tools so that this will be easier to do in practice. And this will still have to do um, maybe at a national level also uh, by, by, by inviting commercial operators to, to help us uh, make things easy. This is really crucial for us. And then I think that we really need to work on awareness and, uh, and, 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 and figuring out you know, how can we create the right in incentives because if no one really asks for this service, you know, it will not happen. And if clients don't uh, pay for this extra, uh, for these, for documenting these extra benefits, of course, it will be uh, pretty difficult to do uh, to do for for architects. So we really need to create this uh, awareness, and we need to uh, be very uh, systematic and methodical about how to document the benefits that uh, levels can uh, can do. So um, that is what I wish uh, for the process and. Um, I am very happy to be able to uh, to discuss this further and to possibly contribute during the testing phase. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter Andrea. So, uh, just a very quick question to you: um, Do you think clients are interested in the conclusions drawn from from these kinds of projects? And and is there is there something that uh, architects can do to make uh, to translate some of this data into more tangible? Um, value. I think that clients are actually very interested in being able to to tell a great compelling story that will differentiate the project among you know the vastness of uh, buildings that are built. So it's really important that you can have a way to say, well, okay, we saved you know 50% of carbon emissions you know compared to this other building or compared to this standard. And this is why I think that benchmarking is really important and also something where we need to make the all the projects that uh, all the data on the projects that are reported to the level to make them public so that you can be begin to use it as a voluntary uh, framework for benchmarking. There's nothing that incentivizes people so much as sort of being a little bit competitive. And but to be competitive we need to measure up, you know, what is better than what, you know. Uh, which which solution is best? How can you differentiate? And I think that's really crucial. It's sort of an essential psychological uh, mechanism. That's really, really helpful. Sure. And I think, I'm sure Josephine will have some things to say about this as well. And uh, I'm just going to, I'm aware that we ran a little bit late because of the, um, uh, the technical glitches. Um, if um, 
if you don't mind, we're going to give Josefina five more minutes to discuss the um, the pilot, and then if um, if you care to stay in the online, we will have we can have some more questions afterwards. Um, I hope that's okay for a few or for lots of you, and hopefully for the presenters too. Josefina, over to you. Thank you, Judith. Um, yes. Uh, I have not yet, well, I have presented levels, what it is and who it is for, <laughs> uh, how it's been, been structured. Um, but I have not talked to you about how to test levels yet, and that's what I'm going to do now. So, um, what we have now, since, since actually last summer, is, is something on, on paper. We call it the beta version of levels. Uh, but what we want to do, of course, before we launch this fully and go sort of full speed, is to test it. So I will now talk about the test phase, the objectives and the scope of this test phase, and what do you test, how, why, and who could test. So the testing objectives, rather the objectives of the test phase is that in two years' time, we want to have a tool which is ready for the market, a tool which is, has robust indicators and, and suitable guidance for all the three levels that I mentioned to you before. Now, obviously, we have the indicators and we have guidance uh, that comes with them, but I want, or we want to make sure that this is actually uh, exactly what is needed. Uh, so that's what the test phase will be about. It will run for two years. Uh, the, we will also seek to understand from this test phase what are actually the efforts needed to work with levels in terms of resources, uh, timing, and money. Um, I have a lot of questions on that. How long does it take to work with levels? If I want to use those indicators, how much resources do I need to put in? Well, that is something that we cannot answer yet, but we certainly hope that the test phase will give us the answers to those kinds of questions so that we can deliver on those questions in two years' time. We also expect to understand better during this test phase uh, what would be the necessary support mechanisms for the implementation of levels in two years' time then. So during the testing, it is very important for us for the Commission that we have testing projects, that is, projects that are testing the indicators of levels and, and the guidance that come with it um, in, in different kinds of projects in different parts of Europe, obviously. So what I mean with that is that we need to have a good range concerning the geographical spread of those, those building projects, that we have both residential buildings and offices which are on which levels are uh, being tested. That again, we look at both new build and renovation projects, and that of course that it involves different kinds of building professionals as well. So levels can be tested on either ongoing or finalized building projects where there is sufficient uh, information available. And again, coming back to the to the uh, question of having a good uh, good distribution of projects between office, residential, new goods, and major renovations. So what would be tested during the test phase? Well, uh, we haven't gone into detail um, uh, uh, during this webinar about the different indicators. There are about 10 of them. We understand that most billing projects will not look at all the different indicators during the test phase. So we have suggested or we have sort of focused uh, um, on, on five of those indicators which we believe are, um, let's say, from the basis of levels where we would like most testing projects to, to, or, or to work with, work on those, on those indicators. And then the other ones, uh, we certainly need to see that uh, enough billing projects are, are testing them as well. But the five ones here listed are the ones which we believe are the core ones. I will not go into detail on those, but you, we have identified them and we have some, some um, guidance notes specifically w which explains why we believe these are the most important ones for the test phase. How would you do if you're interested in levels? Well, <clears throat> you will actually agree with us, the European Commission, to provide certain feedback on your testing, obviously on the indicators themselves, where we have 
a, a, a specific common reporting format where we would like to collect that information. But also on your general experience, uh, where we would have a um, specific survey which would pick up some of those aspects. So for example, questions around how much effort did you need to put into it? Were they, did you find the indicators useful? Did you learn anything when you were uh, useful for yourself when you were using the indicators, etc. Uh, and if you uh, commit to provide this kind of feedback to us at the end of your testing, then during your testing, you will access technical support from the Commission side. So we have a technical help desk, which is up and running, for example. We host regular webinars. We will have the first one in a few weeks' time. Uh, we will have a platform where testers can exchange information, etc. This is again part of our website. I showed you another part in, in the previous um, presentation of mine. But uh, on our website, there is very detailed information on how you can participate in the test phase. There is also the place where you can actually register your building project that you wish to, to include in the test phase. But several different kinds of supporting documents which sort of guides you in deciding, do I want to test? And if I do want to test, what is it that I want to test? and at what level, and, and how should I do to do that. So there's plenty of, of uh, <coughs> short documents. These are all a couple of pages only, where you can get more hands-on information on that. Why would you choose to test? Well, when I talk to, to billing professionals which are involved in the test phase, they list a number of different reasons. Um, they see it as a way of developing knowledge and skills in areas which they see as clearly emerging uh, policy areas and they want to have a key role in, in shaping the development of, of what is uh, so far, well, which is the Europe's first policy for environmental performance of buildings, and likely also becoming national policies in many countries. So taking part in the test phase, it's really an opportunity to, to, to take part in, in, in shaping this, this kind of policy. But it is also, of course, about improving their own business development acumen and understanding of, of other green building tools as well, because as I said, we see labels as a, as a common language for, for different kinds of tools being used out there. And also, uh, the way that uh, levels have been developed, um, if you're using levels, you actually assure that buildings are helping to deliver on global as well as regional priorities, because we have, of course, taken into account different kinds of for example, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals when we develop levels, just as well as, as the major, uh, bigger policy initiatives in Europe when it comes to circular economy, energy efficiency, etc. So just to say that uh, any organization managing or taking part in a building project can test levels. Uh, you just need to be willing to provide us with the feedback. We are not selecting projects. You don't have to apply and get selected. We are so keen on having all kinds of different building projects, uh, regardless of what life cycle stage they may be active at right now or where they are located in Europe to take part in this testing. Mm. So uh, on the website, which I showed you before, um, you will find out how you can register or how you can send in questions to ask us more about uh, would my building project be, be, be useful for testing? Um, there are lots of uh, frequently, um, um, frequently questions and answers there as well to those. Um, so please have a look at our website. Uh, read a bit uh, on the support documents to see what would be necessary to test in order for, for your building project to test. Um, discuss within your consortium if you would be willing to provide this kind of feedback and, and sign up. And you will, uh, as I said before, you will receive support from us, technical support during the test phase. Uh, and in return, of course, we want to hear what you, what you thought about it. I think that's it from my side. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Many thanks to Sophie. Nice excellent introduction. Um, a question from the audience. Who or which institution is going to manage the level system when the test phase will be closed? Is it going to be DG Environment? Is it going to be a contractor? Yes, so as I said before, uh, we are not setting up um, a database uh, on the Commission side, and, and neither are we uh, providing certification of any sort. So at, at in a certain way, there will be no 
with managing of this common language from the Commission side. Now, in the beginning, of course, there would have to be uh, managing and follow-up and making sure that it is indeed uh, functioning the way it was it was uh, developed to, to do. Uh, so there it will have to be, I would assume, the, the same organizations that have developed it, which is Teach Environment um, being the responsible for it, together with Teach Pro. But then in the long run, it is not supposed to be something which uh, which need to be managed as such from our side. Uh, if we see that the way it is being used, uh, this would need more, uh, this would require more hands-on support from, from the Commission. This is something that we would have to, discuss, have to discuss at that point in time then. Okay, great. Um, someone, um, Someone was asking where they can download levels and have and have full access of it. So uh, I think there's a link in your presentation. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. I believe in the first presentation, uh, the one that I had uh, in the beginning of this webinar, um, there is a link to the website, and there you can find. I don't know if I can very quickly go back. Or do I need to click through all of them? Yes, you would, I'm afraid. I think it's easier if we just <coughs> circulate the, the web link to everyone again. Yes. So, in any case, in my in my initial presentation, um, there, uh, there, are, there is a link. Yeah, and if you go there... I can go back. Yeah. It is on slide 12, actually, in this, in this pack. I don't know if that helps anyone. It is on the concluding slide in my first uh, presentation this morning. Um, there is a link uh, where you will find all our different kinds of information. Um, so you will find uh, the longer documents where you see what levels is and how it works uh, and very, very precise uh, information on how to use it. But you will also find the places where you'll, you'll have where to register, how you do that, and the different supporting documents, short supporting documents for the test phase. So everything is on that website, actually. Excellent. So if, uh, there's one more question from Stefano. How levels can work with sustainability schemes like LEED, BRIAM, DGMB, et cetera? Yes. Um, so we are in close contact with those certification schemes, of course. And as I mentioned in the beginning, um, European schemes have been very much involved in um, the development stage or development phase of levels, and we've been working in close contact with them. Um, because for them, it was it was very important from the beginning that levels could be something which uh, where they could pick up the core indicators and use them in their own certification schemes. That was actually something that they came to ask us before we started with the development of levels. They said we would like to be comparable on some core indicators, and we would like uh, the Commission to, to support us uh, and, and the sector as such to develop uh, those kinds of indicators, or identify, rather, those kinds of indicators. So that has been one important reason for developing levels, but certainly not the only one, not at all. But this means that um, we are now uh, seeing how, for example, DGNB already last summer in their new revision, um, they have included a number of the levels indicators in their new scheme or in their revised scheme, so they're already making use of those indicators. We also know from Brian Global that in their next revision, they will be looking at how to include a number of the, of the levels indicators as well because they see this as very useful for them. So they are also keen on, on seeing how the, the web, sorry, how the test phase will uh, will uh, work out, of course. So we are working very closely with them, indeed. One more question, Josefina, uh, from Heine Lippe. Is there an idea to integrate the embodied energy issues more as in common systems? Um, I think the show already embodied energy is already included. Yeah, we're already phone. including embodied energy. So I wonder, perhaps, if the if the person who asked this question maybe he hasn't looked fully into the levels indicators, which I totally understand. But just to assure you then that the embodied energy is indeed included in one of the indicators. We are looking at the life cycle global warming potential, and of course, there the embodied energy is, is included. That's an important part 
of levels, I would say. Okay, so uh, we've heard a wonderful range of perspectives on, on levels and a lot of uh, detailed insights and overviews. Um, and so I, I would like to apologize again for the technical glitches and for the time we took to fix them. And many thanks to everyone for sticking with us. And also many thanks to all the speakers today. I hope you enjoyed the session and that you will find ways for you and your colleagues to join the private. And with that, over and out from us. Thank you very much, Judith. Thank you, everybody. I think it was a great uh, webinar with lots of very interesting information.